Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about autism stories. On today's episode, Drew Adamick joins us to discuss being a financial planner and his podcast, Divergent Finances. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Drew, thanks so much for joining me here today on Autism Stories. Thank you. Great to be here, Doug. I'd love to start off by learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? So it's been interesting as well, too, because I was first diagnosed back in well over 20 years ago. Um, The story how it came about was I was in grade seven and I got suspended twice in one year for various different types of behavior that necessitated going into counseling services. And that was eventually though I got found out when I first got my initial diagnosis around 2001. And then it was reconfirmed a few years, few years later as well too there. So that kind of, kind of helps, uh, kind of, kind of starts to do it. So the initial diagnosis was back, it was, the, it was originally the Asperger syndrome. So but of course, as we all know, that all this, it's all part of the big autism family now. So, <laughs> but uh, but that's kind of where my story kind of begins at this point in terms of like diagnosis and stuff like that. I think it's just been kind of a step since then, since school and that kind of stuff going to that I found going through high school quite challenging, not just as an autistic individual, but then also dealing with queer related stuff as well too. They're kind of being neuroqueer as well. So that kind of all those challenges. University was a much such a different experience as well too. There in fact I was in my element back in my in my university days as well too there. And then it's just been, you know, then graduating from university and then trying to make sense of my career and it's taken me well over ten years to kind of get where I am today. So that's kind of dealing with all the challenges as they present themselves and uh, being an autistic adult in a trying to navigate and being a self-advocate because we all know how challenging that can be as well. So was looking back on it being suspended a great moment for you in your life leading to learning about your autism? It was great to learn a little bit about being being on the autism spectrum. It sucks being suspended because it was just like who yeah, because who like who likes getting the trouble, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Now uh, you have a bachelor's degree in political science, but ended up becoming a financial planner. What is it about financial planning that's led you to do this work for over a decade now? So an interesting story at this point too. So during my third year of university, I did something quite crazy, and I ran for parliament in. My home in my in my hometown back in Canada is all too there. Didn't get very far. I ran, uh, I ran in the it ran in northern north central BC. I got a distant third place, but it was a very interesting experience. One of my fellow candidates in that election, who was in the same party as I am at the time, was um, a financial longtime financial planner and retirement planning expert in Canada called his name is Garth Turner. I uh, used to be a former federal cabinet minister as well too there and been has published many books as well too there and he has a very prolific blog as well too that that was been on my reading list for a time and you know we had a bit of email back and forth to 2008 during the election but then following through reading his blog you know later on kind of led me to think maybe I should take a look at financial planning as a and and like kind of wealth management as a career option and this was kind of around 2012 2013 I ended up in the financial industry. It kind of came as a little bit by accident to a degree because initially I was looking at going back to school to doing a master's program. But while I was waiting for the university I was applying to to approve my application, I ended up getting a job with one of Canada's largest banks. 
initially it was just part time, but it eventually led into permanent to a permanent full time position. And I haven't really looked back since at this point. That was 2013 that I started there. So it's been uh, apart from a brief time where I ended up moving to food and beverage management for a bit to get some management experience. I've been in the financial industry pretty consistently since 2013. So I think it just it just happened. And I just I think part of it's just wanting to help people. Um, financial literacy and financial education is so not present regardless of stuff. That's one of the things that's sorely lacking in this day, in this day and age as well, too. And just that's something that's always been, to me, it's vitally important for, for neurodivergent folks um, to know about taking control of their personal financial picture as well so that they can, you know, leverage what they can to the best of their ability because, as we all know, life's not getting any cheaper. So we got to do what we can to go through there. So that's kind of partly it's just wanting to give back and kind of make a difference in people's lives. So that's kind of what led me to that, uh, to kind of the financial planning industry. So whenever I'm focusing on one aspect of my life, um, I, I try to like think about how it might impact the other parts of uh, my life, you know, so taking a holistic approach is really whenever possible is really important to me. So which made it interesting for me to read that you're a holistic financial planner. What exactly does holistic financial planning mean to you? Breaking down silos and barriers and looking at an overall picture. One of the challenges in the financial planning field is the different aspects of a financial plan. So there are six key elements of a financial plan. That's the first of it is your budget and your cash flow. The next is planning for your retirement or for or retirement looks so different for people. Sometimes I call it future income planning because, you know, for some people, retirement means, oh, I'm just going to switch to doing this job and not quitting work entirely because I know some people, they retire, they just get so bored. It's like, I need something to do. That, then there's insurance and risk management. Then there's tax planning. And then there's estate planning. The challenge with those six areas is because of the way the financial and the various industries are regulated, there's often these silos as well too there, especially when it comes to taxes, because ideally an accountant or a certified professional should be giving you tax advice. Um, same thing when it comes to an estate planning for drafting up a will and your power of attorney and that kind of stuff to lawyers or, you know, lawyers are the ones that have to draft those up as well too there. To do investments, you have to be licensed to do that. And if they're not, then they're obviously you've got other issues to worry about, to say the least. Same thing too with insurance. It's just there's all these silos that these areas kind of into it. So a good holistic planner is about breaking down those silos as much as we can. We obviously can't do them all because of regulations and stuff, but it's about coordinating and working together within those as much as possible, factoring in all of those key areas and kind of looking at the big picture. Because ultimately at the end of the day, you want to leverage your money to make it work for you. And that means going across all of these other barriers because there's, you know, all these other silos and all these other key components. While they form good components, they can't work in isolation. They have to be coordinated. And that's kind of where a good, a good financial planner is that coordinator. We are that, to, to borrow the football terminology, we are the main quarterback for that to make sure that the ball gets to where it's supposed to go. As part of your financial planning practice, you offer LGBTQAI2S plus and neurodivergent community engagement and outreach. So what suggestions may you have for other financial planners in supporting clients from one or both of those communities? There's a lot of crossover, but let's start with uh, with the queer community at this point as well, too, there just to keep it simple and straightforward here. Part of it's just being understanding of a lot of the challenges that queer folks face at this point. Um, for example, I was on a, um, a call with a couple of other planners in the industry as well too there. And um, one of the things that came about is often the challenges that people have like that are in the queer community. So traditional means of saving for finances might not make sense because for example, think, oh, if your cost of living is so expensive, why don't you move to a more affordable location? Not realizing that 
many queer folks often go to more expensive places to live out of safety because they're often in larger urban areas. You know, for example, in Canada, typically that's Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal to a degree. And Toronto and Vancouver in Canada are hugely, they're so expensive to live in. Um, but people often, but people in the queer community often think that that is a sacrifice worth it because of being in a community close by with others like them and having access to those resources, which in smaller cities or in small towns may not be there. And even in smaller communities are downright outright hostile as well. So it just depends on understanding why people are in specific circumstances and why the, what might appear to be the logical perspective of, oh, you know, maybe look at ordaining to, to a location that's within your budget. Well, that may not work for other reasons as well. And then for neurodivergent, for the neurodivergent community as well, it's just simply a matter of just being understanding, but also realizing that not everyone is necessarily kind of on that same kind of wavelength at this point. I know for a lot of people, I know it's been, frankly, it's been huge over the past since the pandemic of virtual meetings a little too there. I can't tell you how much that's been such a game changer because being able to meet with people when and where that's most comfortable for them is often a lot easier for people that, you know, they're too afraid to go out or they don't want to pick up the phone because for many people, phone calls are just, just use up so much spoons a little too there or they don't even want to go into uh, like a bank branch or or, a, or an office because it's can be intimidating or it just can be budgeting or they don't have a car or just part you know you know that you know that kind of thing and so it's providing flexible opportunities for meeting people where they are but also just basically realizing that everyone takes their approaches differently for finances and stuff unfortunately in the industry we do have to make a lot of assumptions and it's partly because dealing with all the liability and stuff like that, because of so people have been burnt so badly in the past, we have to say certain things to people, even if it just goes in one ear and out the other, and it's Greek to them, or just it's it's like a foreign language to them. But we still have to say and disclose these things because we have to demonstrate to our regulators that we've gone through a lot of things, even though it's just sometimes we have to translate it from English to English, and sometimes even make it even more English, if you know what I mean. You're currently helping uh, Canadian first-time home buyers to successfully plan for home ownership. So what are some things for people to consider if buying a home is a good financial decision for them or not? Well, it all depends on one's individual circumstances. It all depends on where things fit into it. One of the things that I do consider that kind of sets me apart from other planners is most people do tend to think of real estate as an asset class, first and foremost. I'm not that type of planner, but then again, this is my personal bias at play here. But at the same time, too, if you're buying your first home, you're obviously planning to live into it. First and foremost, it's meant to be shelter. But you also have to look at the costs associated with home ownership and, and figure that out vis-a-vis -vis renting. Again, it all depends on the community that you're living in or where you like to live in. So it depends on what your down payment's going to that needs to be as well to there, but also things like hey, whether the more what are your costs associated with it. So what's the mortgage payments going to be here? If what the, what are the property tax payments are going to be like as well to there? What are your utility bills or costs are going to be here? If you're going to be buying a condo, what condo fees are you going to have to pay on top of that? What are some of the full your full all in costs? Because most people just seem to think of, oh, we'll just take care of the mortgage payment. Well, no, you got to factor in all those other things like utilities, property taxes, and property taxes are not going down in Canada, anyways. They're always going; they all they're always going up because that's the only way in Canada that many local governments have to raise revenue for local services to pay for your roads, your garbage collection, etc. So it's about looking at those costs and then determining it vis-a-vis -vis renting as to what makes what makes sense the most for you. Now, for sometimes people have traditionally looking for home ownership because again, what people are looking for is security of tenure. They want to be able to live in a place here and not have to worry about getting evicted because let's say for example, um your place is, you know, you've had a low rent for a while but, you know, a landlord wants to 
raise their rent and you know they can only redo it so much so they do rent you know if you might have heard of the term rent eviction especially if you've in the greater vancouver area that's a bit of an infamous term where people ostensibly say they're doing renovations but it's in reality it's basically as a means to kind of increase the price of rent because again we've had such cheap money for a long time people are looking to you know from a cost benefit pr perspective they're trying to maximize their rent so whether or not you believe in, you know, whether or not you believe that's a good thing or not as well too, there is, you know, is, you know, that's your own opinion. But again, people are wanting to raise costs because again, if they're into it to make up, to make money, that's how they're going to do it. So you got to factor in what's for your individual circumstance, what's the easiest thing to do? What's, what makes the most sense now versus what's going to make most sense later here, but also going to depends on where you are in your career. If your career is going to take you around locations you're going to be moving quite a bit buying may not necessarily make sense because you want the flexibility of being able to you know hand in the lease and not have to worry about closing costs and all that other stuff or maintaining a property because for every buyer there has to be a seller and you know and vice versa as well too so you got to figure out what's best for you and in this day and age here in canada because we have now where interest rates are back up to pre-2008 levels we are not used to seeing interest rates like this, which is increasing the cost of borrowing, which is reducing the purchase price that you can make. That's why you now need to determine, okay, but people, but prices are still being sticky. They're still not quite going down there. So does it make sense to jump into home ownership and worth paying that much money into something that's going to, you know, it's all about individual circumstances, right? And of course it goes, well, it goes back to the saying, all real estate is local. Every market's different. So Again, it all comes back to your own individual circumstances. I'm wondering about, you know, as autistic people, you know, obviously the employment rates are not, they're not great. So I'm just wondering for those that might not have consistent income, like does a financial planner make sense for them at all? Or, or do you have other suggestions for them on how to use their money? Everyone needs a financial plan. But again, I'm biased as well to them, a financial planner. Yeah. But I do think everyone needs a financial plan. And I would say those that have precarious income and, in, or, and or inconsistent income need a plan even more so. And this has been one of the huge challenges in the industry is to, is I, the way I say it is the people that need advice the most are the ones that can't really afford to traditionally get it. Right. Um, one of the things I'm doing to give back as well, in addition to, with my own with my own personal practice, I do have a, every new client that comes see me. I had to do a three for thirty minute free initial meeting just to see like what are you looking to do here? Here's some tips and you know what can we do here, and then kind of go from next steps there. But I'm also a member up here in Canada. I'm a member of the uh, one of the professional associations I'm a part of is the Financial Planning Association of Canada, and I'm also involved with that group with their pro bono committee. So I'm uh, one of about a dozen or so financial planners that work to give back through this program to Canadians that are looking for like a, you know, 30, 30 to 60 minute consultation. They're just looking for some advice. So how this works essentially is you apply on the FPAC website. There's a pro bono site. Um, what you're looking to talk with a planner about, and then it's sent to one of the planner, one of the volunteer planners. Then we reach out to that person to say, okay, let's schedule a talk. What do you need help with the most here? So it's a bit more like kind of one-off advice at, at this point. But again, but it's part of way of making sure that people needing advice the most is able to get it because, you know, for example, to maintain my certified financial planning designation, I have to do 25 hours of continuing education credits per year. Sometimes it involves, and of course, I have to then pay an annual licensing fee for my practice at have insurance and all that stuff. So, you know, we're professionals. We got, um, we got bills and stuff to pay. And, but traditionally people in the industry tend to go after the higher net worth people, those with higher incomes, because those are the ones who can afford to pay for it. But it still perpetuates that where it's the people that need the planning the most are the ones that can't really afford to pay for it. Or if they do go to places like that, they're oftentimes may not necessarily getting the best advice because even though, they're, even though like I said, I've started my career in the banking industry and work with banks and credit unions, um, and there's lots of great people that work there. Places like that do have, there is a sales culture there. Their job is not necessarily to act in your best interest first and foremost. That person in front has targets to meet. They got a job to do. So 
whether or not it's in a person's best interest to do that again up in the up in the air right so you got you got to be cognizant of that at this point but i think it's vitally important that you need to have a plan in place especially if your income is inconsistent because it's all about making sure that you can make your bills because your income might be inconsistent but your bills are just you know as much as we'd like to have our electricity power bills be like oh hey i can't afford to pay can you wait till i get paid they're like no we want to get paid now every month here please and thank you wish the world didn't work that way but Unfortunately, that's how it works. So, but you, that's why it's important to have that budgeting strategy to make sure that what income that you are getting, that you're able to cover your expenses. The importance of things of having an emergency fund, of having at least three to six months worth of expenses saved up should be of the first priority of any successful financial plan is just in case you do face precarious employment or a job loss or something like that, that you've got some cushion room to help cover you because. For example, in Canada, we do have what's called EI, employment insurance, but that may not necessarily cover what you were fully making previously at a previous job, for example. So having that cushion room of savings and stuff kind of helps tie that nest egg. Plus, it also allows someone to, for example, spend some time to actually look at a job that's aligned with them rather than taking the first thing that's available for them because they need a paycheck, right? So, but of course, as I'm sure many of us listing are well aware it's easier said than done i always uh love talking with other podcasters and you recently started a podcast divergent finances what have you learned uh, so far as a result of the uh podcasting experience that i need to look around for a couple different <laughs> good good quality audio editing software and stuff like that i'm, I'm i am leveraging uh, some of my video uh, editing stuff that I learned back in high school. Oh my God, I'm dating myself at this point. The last time I took, it's funny, I was in grade nine when I took a whole bunch of film editing courses when I actually took a a grade nine, 10, 11, and grade 12 course for film editing in my grade nine year. Um, I spent, you know, and basically I spent my entire year in some sort of film film development class, but that was, oh my God, 2000, when I was ninth grade, that's what, 2003? Yeah, I remember, I remember it was around 2003, 2002. I remember that was when Attack of the Clones came out, Star Wars Episode Two, and that was the big thing that everyone in the class was really wanting to see for that one year. <laughs> um, but um, you, using YouTube at this point, just because I think it's because I'm also trying to, uh, hoping to incorporate some shorts and stuff like that, and just keeping it all in one place, I just think it's an easier um, thing to it. But what I've learned probably as a result of it, this experience has been just the importance of having consistency a bit because... You know, people want to have, you know, we want to have consistent stuff. Although I tried to be consistent, but unfortunately, like I did deviate from my schedule a bit because I wanted to get one episode out before uh, a financial deadline in Canada for people awareness. And then after I did that, I felt got a cold. So focusing on that said my voice wasn't the greatest. So it was just, you know, giving time to recuperate. So, but then I'm feeling better now. So then it's then catching and then I've got like, oh, I should probably catch up. So I was spending some time earlier today, just, um, you know, been doing a few different episode ideas at this point. And um, I've tried doing scripts for my podcast, but I tend to come a bit almost robotic when I do a script. I prefer doing the stream of consciousness stuff. I mean, it's, it's just more it's just more authentic plus also allows me i can just go on an info dump tangent on something that comes up in my head and i always love going up like that right so. and uh and lastly how can our listeners learn about you and your podcast divergent finances beyond this interview search on youtube divergent finances i'm also under my channel divergent financial planning um, if you want to check out my website uh, www.divergentfe.ca you can also uh, email me at info at divergentfp.ca. Um, I am on LinkedIn as well too. They're both for my business and for myself available on LinkedIn. I am not on Facebook. I am not on the site formerly known as Twitter. And I probably won't just because I have a lot of ethical considerations regarding Facebook and regarding Meta's business practices. And don't get me started about um about the, the former bird site at this point. But uh, so I try to keep, I try to be strategic in where I am for um, kind of where I am when it comes to my social media and stuff like that, because 
again, a lot of times there's so much content out there. It's about being sold. It's about being strategic and finding finding a fit that works for people. And uh, that's kind of where I think, you know, check me out on YouTube as well too there. Um, but again, if I need any questions, those are the places where you can find me. Well, thanks so much, Drew. I'm going to be checking out uh, the Divergent Finances podcast. Really appreciate uh, getting the time to meet you. Thanks so much for joining me here on Autism Stories. Thank you very much, Doug. Thanks so much to Drew for the conversation. To learn about Drew, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. We always love hearing from you and would especially love to hear from you relating to this episode on what financial obstacles do you feel like you need help with the most and how do you feel about working with an expert to help you guide you through those challenges? Here at Autism Personal Coach, our clients are the experts, our coaches are the guides. The majority of supports for autistics are not helpful. They try to fix us, not support us. That's why many are confused when we say our clients are the experts, experts of their lived experience. Our clients are the experts for what has worked for them and about the things they need and want in their lives. Our coaches first listen to our clients and then ask thoughtful questions offer resources, and strategize with our clients so they can get what they need to thrive. Would you want a guide in your life to coach you to help you get the things you desire? If so, then visit AutismPersonalCoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone else you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable an educational experience as you would listening to Autism Stories would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.